Welcome to RV Talk Radio. Here we talk about RV living, RV lifestyles, and RV travel. We also celebrate the RV lifestyle that gives us the chance to do outdoor activities that we couldn't do in a normal lifestyle. So thanks for joining us. Grab yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and let's talk about RVs. This video is made possible by Ranger Rob Poopy Bags, available on Amazon right now. Before we get started, please take the time to subscribe, then click on the bell icon to get notified of our future videos. Well, hello everyone and welcome to RV Talk Radio. This is episode 124 and I want to welcome you to the show. Appreciate all the great feedback and the support. And uh, yes, we are trying harder to get episodes out every week. If you haven't figured out the schedule yet, we try to get our video uh, videos or our audio, you know, <laughs> it's kind of a mixture, uh, out on Mondays. So uh, yeah, so today, um, motivated by a couple of videos out there, but um, and, and videos have come out over time. And one is the obsession with cost. And uh, I think every single video or every channel uh, has done a show on cost. And uh, I want to kind of make a clear statement. That's like asking, how much does it cost to buy a house? Or that's how much, how much does it cost to get an apartment? And the answer is, it's different for everyone. But I'm going to give some, you know, some scenarios of, of, of uh, the beginning and the ongoing costs of RVing. And uh, let's say you do an exit strategy and you still use your RV part time like we do. What's the cost to do that? So hopefully uh, this show will uh, uh, one is tell you uh, the, the very first piece of uh, advice is it's different for everyone. Even if I used any numbers here, it's gonna be different for you. And it also depends on whether you have a career where you can finance something or not finance something. Uh, Cause uh, uh, America's based on financing. That's just how it is. If you don't believe me, just most of these RV channels are financing, but no, um, the old time guys, they're pretty good at being uh, minimalist. So they're, you know, and they're doing a lot of channel stuff and making money. So they're um, doing a pretty good job at saving money and not going into debt. And that's great, too. I mean, basically, debt is evil. <laughs> but uh, debt is also necessary sometimes. So typically, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about both and uh, see where we go. And so, uh, yeah, hang on tight. Let's talk about RV cost. So one of the things that I definitely noticed about, uh, let's say, middle class folks getting ready to RV full time is going overboard. One is <laughs> getting on YouTube, watching every single video out there about getting uh, RVing and then also seeing people doing breakdown of costs and stuff. And uh, then they run out and go buy things that they may not need for Example, I heard of one channel where they're describing that they ran out, um, they were, they knew they wanted to do YouTube. So they did, took a five, like a $5,000 class and also buy almost every piece of equipment that they recommended. And, uh, uh, it's easy to fall into that. Um, I, when I first started, I did realize I, I had some, a lot, a lot of cameras and, and over time while, while traveling, and it's different if you're traveling or not traveling. Um, you tend to have a go-to camera. Uh, in my case, it was usually 90% the GoPro because you know you, when you're traveling, one of the first things you do is you you get to a place and it's like in, and you're not prepared to say, "Oh my gosh, what a great you know shot!" or "I want to get a quick action thing." You, that go-to camera we always kept right next to us was the GoPro. Uh, of course, we have better cameras too, but um, 
but much more expensive. And when you're traveling, especially if you're on the road, you don't want to leave that one out. Um, you kind of protect it a little more. So you kind of have your all all terrain kind of camera right next to you all the time. And that, t that tend to be our GoPro. Um, and yet we've got a $1,200 $1, G40 uh, uh, Canon that we keep. And I, I, <laughs> I don't like to keep that one out in the open. And so, uh, uh, plus we have, you know, the DSLRs and uh, every, all kinds of stuff and it can get ridiculous. And so the problem is, is, um, what Sherry and I did our second time that we full-timed RV is before I retired, we literally got out of our apartment and, uh, uh, we had, you know, we bought a fifth wheel almost a year before we ever retired and we set it up not that far away from work and literally left our apartment six months before we even went back on the road, which was really nice. Uh, since we've done full timing before and stuff, we kind of have a general idea of things we want. But living in your RV six months before you actually hit the road will help you buy necessary items and also prevent you from buying unnecessary items if you watched all these RV channels. Um, one of the things in cost that may catch you off guard is internet. And if you're doing internet for and need it for business, or when I say business, it could be you're either a virtual worker and or you're doing the videos and stuff like that and you are depending on it or if you have children with you maybe you want to stream things and stuff um or maybe you just depend on streaming uh maybe you're a netflixer and you don't like television that much and stuff that one will throw you for a loop um i would suggest that uh your first focus would be extending your reach and that's what Sherry and I did, and we use the Wi-Fi Ranger. Um, don't use it use it all the time, but we had it and used it in some unique areas, um, especially like how oh, if you go to Thousand Trails and stuff, a lot of those places will have their internet at the community center. Well, you don't want to take your dang laptop over the community center. You want to work from your RV. Well, what's nice about Wi-Fi Ranger? is typically if you know what the ID and password is for the community internet, uh, you can tap into it <laughs> from a, a longer range. And I, I did that a couple of times. Or if you're staying at somebody's house in their yard and they have internet, um, you could tap into their internet with your Wi-Fi Ranger. We do that, all, we do that right now, in fact, uh, up in Central Oregon. So your cost, uh, you know, can um, right up front, uh, for equipment would be, uh, depending if you want to do internet stuff, uh, remember 90% of you guys do not. So that's not really a cost. You have to go too hog wild on, uh, if you're just worried about emails and banking and stuff like that, you can keep your cost down pretty good. Uh, you still may want an air card. So in those unusual places, you can reach the internet through your cell phone service. So, uh, you know, those you know, uh, Wi-Fi Ranger at the time was around, I think, set six or seven hundred dollars. Um, when we bought our RV, we had Camping World, and I told you we we have a, didn't have a bad experience with them. They installed my Wi-Fi Ranger for me, and also uh, installed my solar. So another cost that may come up in the, up front is: Are you anticipating uh, that you want to? Uh, to go all out on solar or just have something that kind of helps keep your batteries charged up. Before we lived in our fifth wheel, one of the things that kept happening is we had our fifth wheel stored up in Anacortes, Washington in a storage area. And once in a while, and I couldn't figure out what was doing it, we get there to go pick up the RV and I couldn't get the hydraulics to work because the batteries were dead. So when I had Wi-Fi Ranger put in, I also decided to have a 85 watt solar system installed on the roof and I decided to put a 1000 watt um, 
amp uh, <laughs> uh, inverter in the back towards the uh, entertainment system so I can convert uh, DC to AC to uh, you know for our entertainment system when we wanted to and uh, <clears throat> I wanted to have a, my batteries being trickle charged all the time uh, even when it was in storage like right now it's in you know it's sitting up in storage and every time I've gone there in the last year and a half since it's been up there the batteries have had power and uh, what a nice thing and, and I also Montana's have a kill switch for the whole system even with that off I had it bypassed so the batteries were still being charged with the entire system off so uh, uh, something to consider um, I can't remember exactly the cost uh, but because I also had them do the installation but you know since they were doing my Wi-Fi Ranger and my little uh, uh, solar panel up there uh, the cost was relatively maybe around 500 bucks something like that um, you know I had to pay for the parts and and the labor so uh, before you even get started I recommend that if you could try to live in your RV for a couple of months before you actually hit the road or retire or whatever um, to work out the bugs uh, you may find out before you even get started that you hate the bed um, when you buy a new RV, I don't care if it's a, uh, a beautiful 40 foot, which we've had before, or, well, I got to say that we had a Discovery <laughs> back in 2007, and it had one of those air bed things where uh, dial, you dialed it in. That mattress was awesome because you could change it. Um, but it had downfalls too, by the way, which you wouldn't find until you traveled. But um, here's something you may not know. If you have a fancy RV like we had and it has the uh, air control mattresses uh, I can't think of the right word for that if you're traveling and going over high elevation you could damage that if you have too much air in those because of expansion and um, <laughs> just like one time we we're in Utah you get up to five six thousand uh, feet going over some of the passes and stuff um, we literally had toothpaste and soap stuff uh, explode and make a mess all over because of the different elevations. So something to keep in mind if you decide to get a bed like that. But typically, uh, the two RVs we had, and we've always used new RVs. We never bought used ones. Uh, we ended up changing the mattress out because they usually just put a cheap springy mattress in there and we put in a... Uh, a lot of uh, those foam mattresses and so plan on spending three to five hundred dollars for a good mattress to put in your bed um, in your master bedroom uh, because those springy mattresses are just terrible <laughs> and so I knew right off the bat when we bought our fifth wheel uh, just like any other my RVs before that switch out the mattress so <laughs> So there's $500 right there you need to keep in mind. So it's better to do all this stuff while you're still employed, while you're getting ready to retire or whatever you're doing, and live in it and do this a little bit at a time so you don't get hit with a major bill up front. Ford's RV Refrigeration Training Center, a licensed school, has many objectives for only one product, the RV refrigerator. We educate others so they can provide a repair service in their area, repair their own refrigerator, or when they hear throw it away, buy a new one, they'll know the right questions to ask in order to know whether or not their technician has been properly educated. Since 1984, we have saved RV owners money, provided them the best warranty, and reduced our carbon footprint. We accomplish these objectives daily through our service and training programs. Military veterans can even use their GI Bill for our training program, which includes our customized tools and manuals. Visit RVRefrigeration.com to find free DIY repair videos and information on our service and training programs. As a thanks to Rob Scribner, we're offering his listeners a free 11-point RV refrigerator inspection and one free night of camping at our location in Benton, Kentucky. Go to RVRefrigeration.com to call and make an appointment. That's RVRefrigeration.com. Thanks for listening. Stay cool and GBYAY. Well, getting back to the subject of RV cost and, and getting started, once again, it's going to be different for everyone. Some people have done well with cash, and uh, some people uh, had, uh, if they're just 
waiting till they're older to retire, they may have a chunk of change and actually buy their RV in cash. Or some people bought their houses and uh, or sold their houses and used the cash on that to buy an RV. And uh, what a great way to start. Uh, that wasn't the case with me and Sherry. We financed our RV and we bought ours at Camping World and uh, we didn't have any problems. So um, I, I know there's a lot of uh, stuff going on out there. Um, I'll just kind of leave that one alone because we didn't have, I've never had an issue with, with them, but I used uh, <coughs> the Camping World up in Burlington, uh, Washington State and they run they ran a great operation so um, we're happy campers so one of the things that was nice about living in the rv f at, before we ever started was to work out the bugs every rv is going to be different um you may find that because of the cabinets the way that you hang up your clothes you might want to change things or maybe you have, you're just not happy the way how to store your shoes you might buy a little devices that um, uh, would make storing shoes better. Uh, utilizing the space in the RV is a great time to do that when you're not, when you're, everything's calm and you're living day to day, you can work out problems with cabinets. Uh, like uh, Montana's, you know, you always have these cabinets that are really tall and to a point you can't reach them. <clears throat> So you, um, you know, you may find you want to buy a special kind of step stool. You may uh, want to you find out that cabinets are really high, nice and you know, they're good and deep, but they're really high. So when you store things in it, you still got three quarters of uh, uh, of that shelf not utilizing the space. So you may want to go and get spacers, and you may want to make your own shelving. Um, this is the great time to do that. And, and give yourself time. Don't just give yourself like a couple of weeks. I mean, give yourself months before you actually hit the road and the, allow you to really find out living day to day in your RV what little things perturb you and what things uh, would make storing stuff a little easier. And uh, uh, you may find you may not like the furniture. Like Sherry and I, we had two lounge chairs and a couch. We took one out because it was kind of too close to the television, put in a very nice lounge chair and uh, and kept it like that, and which gained us more room for, because um, we have a cat, so we wanted a place for the litter box that was convenient and out of the way. <clears throat> and also uh, gave us a, uh, extra room to put some extra shelving in. And uh, so that worked out really good. Um, wouldn't have figured that out until we lived in it for a while, realizing there were certain pieces of furniture we just weren't using. And uh, we also had a spare chair in the back for the little desk system. Well, um, what we did is we took that out and put a small, one of those small refrigerators in the back, that which really only works when you're plugged into AC, um, which was great to put extra pop, extra Coke, uh, extra waters, beer, whatever you wanted, we kept in that refrigerator um, because if that refrigerator was off during boondocking, stuff like that, it really didn't hurt anything. It was nothing in there like butter or milk or anything that would spoil. So we actually added an extra refrigerator to our rig by eliminating the desk portion in the back, taking out the chair, and of course we have all that stored in our garage now. Um, and um, so that's what I really highly recommend for cost. You'll be nickel and dime for cost up front, just like a house. You get in a house, you may find you want to put little paper things on your shelving. You may want to change things, put pictures up. Uh, you're going to have general cost just like a house when you first move in or apartment um, to fit your circumstances and to... Uh, each unit's a little different, and that's true with RVs too. So uh, uh, if you can live in your RV, hold still for six months if you can. Um, and of course, it's different if you're not going into a retirement mode. But still, live in your RV before you give up your jobs, all that kind of stuff, to work out the bugs of... Uh, Instead of finding out the hard way when you're in some place that's remote and you can't get the parts or things you want done, uh, we ended up going back to uh, 
uh, Camping World a couple of times to make modifications, um, like the like I said, the Wi-Fi Ranger and adding in uh, uh, solar. And uh, at the same time, since our rig was new, it gave us a chance to. Uh, we had some problems with one of our jacks and stuff like that, and we had extended warranty. It was, that was a good time to work work all the systems and find out if anything was broken or not working right even when you buy a new rv which is also going to be the case with a used rv um you're going to be d discover things that are broken or need to be better than they are before you start traveling we have a crisis dogs are dropping all over the nation affecting large and small dogs of all breeds Citizens are crying out for good dog waste bags. Dog owners' demands have been answered. Ranger Rob Poopy Bags on rolls and sheets. Quality materials, easy tie handles, deeper design, lemon scented on rolls and sheets and made with love. Available at Amazon with free shipping. Yep. And when you guys get ready to uh, travel and you have a pet, you're going to realize you're going to want poopy bags. And uh, yes, some of the places you go, parks and stuff like that, will provide you with really cheap poopy bags that some of them are like, are you kidding? <laughs> so get your own. And so that's why I great, created the uh, Ranger Rob poopy bags because we always ended up buying better ones than what the parks would supply. And I have a particular design I kind of wanted, but I wanted to modify it to make it a little deeper and a little wider. And uh, so that we came up with the Ranger Rob poopy bags. So when you get a chance, get on Amazon, shoot up there. Uh, we do have a coupon uh, on our two new models on rolls and with a dispenser. And uh, take advantage of that. I think you can get 10% off, 5% off, I can't remember. So anyway, getting back to uh, the cost of RVing. The other thing that is good about not moving right off the bat and living in your RV before you even hit the road is your workstations. What works for you? So uh, like I told you, the back of our RV, we actually did not utilize the little desk space and we actually put a, a refrigerator under that spot. We have uh, our entertainment systems all in the back. So it's all different for different RVs. So uh, we decided to use that space differently. And we tend to do all of our electronics, uh, laptops and stuff like that at the dining room table. And occasionally we would use a TV tray type thing in front of a, the couch and or the uh, recliner we had uh, in the living room. But uh, we did not do that too often because we also have pets. So that's a good time to utilize your RV to find out with your pets too. Uh, do you have the space set up right? Do you have it safe for your pets? Do you have your uh, litter box set up in a way that is sanitary and not messy and, and uh, uh, you know where are you going to put it in the RV these are things you need to work out holding still is the best way to do it and then finding the best equipment for uh, how to maintain your electronics and also um, uh, how to maintain your pets their toys their food their litter boxes um, leashes uh, that was the time when we also ended up putting extra hangers up by the door to hang up leashes and car keys because um, what you'll find right away is when you live in a small space you can't leave things out you use something then put it away so making that as easy as possible like your leash when you take your dog for a walk you get in the RV and have a place to put the leash uh, everything has its place so you start learning how to live by putting things in your place so your RV doesn't turn into a pigsty. And it's easy to do. You need to minimalist living. You need to stay organized. And you need to follow your processes that you create. And this is the time to create those processes. So you'll be spending money on little things like special hooks, Maybe a litter box for your uh, cat that's uh, got a cover on it or a little different size that fits the RV better. Um, yeah, so you um, 
when it comes to laptops, you'll be figuring out like extra extension cords, what works, what doesn't, how to charge things. Um, even if you have uh, your at an RV park, you want to pretend you're boondocking, unplug from the spot and then see how well you survive with your electronics and cameras and stuff like that um, to charge things. Of course, you get uh, in trouble a little bit if you run your generator. I recommend, by the way, if you have a fifth wheel, um, a lot of guys will do those portable RV um, generators, and they work all right and stuff like that. But um, I have I had one installed inside my RV up front, so I have the 5500 uh, propane generator, which is super quiet and super convenient, and uh, I can use it in a heartbeat anywhere. I don't have to set it up, plug it in, pull out of the back of the truck. It's there. Uh, yes, I lose some storage and stuff, but uh, at the same time, it's I, it's a great generator, and I've been very happy with it. So uh, um, those are the things you need to consider learning, uh, like what are you going to do for power and what do you want to do for extra power? A lot of people I see get those portable generators. Personally, I wouldn't want to deal with them. One is they're kind of heavy, and as you get older, um, I ended up, I hate to even, uh, I, I hurt myself moving too much heavy things and got myself a, a, a minor hernia. And so now I avoid super heavy stuff. And so I'm glad I don't have to deal with a generator because mine's built in. Uh, things to consider uh, when you're buying your RV up front. So live in your RV uh, up front before you even hit the road to try to work out the bugs and to take care of the nickel and diming things that you would have in a house or apartment uh, to set up the RV the way you want it. And uh, you may find great ways to store your dishes differently by maybe putting a stacker in there. You may want to put liners in. You may want to put a little rubber matting to hold things in place. Because once you hit the road and start moving, <laughs> a whole new set of problems come up. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, switch to, see, I think I got all my main things. Uh, you know, the big thing is learning what kind of dishes you want. Find out what dishes you aren't using. This is the time to figure out whether you overpacked. If there's things you're not using, certain glasses you're not using, certain cups or plates. Um, also, you may want to learn to only keep four, maybe six plates of regular plates as opposed to paper plates. Um, because you should wash your dishes every time you use. You don't want to leave things in your sink and stuff. So uh, you may find that only keeping four plates, four cups, four glasses, um, and that's it just to keep things uh, organized. And plus, if you run out of things, you tend to wash them. <laughs> so how can you improve the process is really what you're trying to do. So uh, let's move over to... Uh, what happens when you start um, traveling? And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, things that come up up front. Before I get into the traveling part of the cost of uh, uh, having an RV, is um, uh, looking at um, what kind of equipment you're doing because you may be starting out with a van or a class C, uh, a trailer, a fifth wheel, or a motorhome. All of them have different needs and different issues. Motorhomes are, I, I'm just going to use the word sophisticated. They are one electronic mechanical nightmare if you really had to learn the, how the, all the systems work. I know this because uh, we RV'd with a 40-foot Discovery back in 2007, and uh, we bought that new. And the other thing I recommend is do not travel far away from your dealership, um, and make sure you have a, at least a one-year warranty system with a brand new rig. You can get extended if you like, and we did that, and we're glad we did. We used it, um, and we did this. Um, now, I didn't buy all my rigs from Camping World, but um, the current rig I have now, I did buy from Camping World, and I did use the extended warranty um, uh, when I had a jack act up and I had some other issue. Can't remember what it was. Anyway, so uh, uh, 
brand new RVs every single time had issues. Uh, one, I had a, a water leak under a sink, under a shower in our motor home. Um, and I had a water issue with a shower. Um, and I literally had the fan snap off the engine um, on the diesel. Uh, luckily, I was still in town and all that stuff, and I had to get it towed with a wrecker. Um, and they replaced it for free and fixed it, and the whole works. But that could have been devastating. So it was really good to take your new rig or whatever rig you bought, and before you leave the region, stick around for a couple of months. Use the rig. Try to figure out if there's any problems. New rigs and used rigs will have their hidden secrets show up over time. So uh, I highly recommend that that will be a cost for you um, to fix things that you would think shouldn't be broke, but it does break or are broken. <laughs> they were built broken. <laughs> so, yeah, you need to know that. <laughs> and that's important. So those are costs that could come up. I couldn't give you a number on that because I don't know what could go wrong in your RV when you buy it. But... The recommendation I give you is stick around the area before you hit the road. Our very, very first time we hit the road in 2006, we had a Montana back then. And we had a tank that leaked and uh, uh, had to special order that stuff. And we had to stay in the area for at least two months before we could actually get that repaired. So, uh, yeah, that was frustrating. No, that wasn't. That was not uh, through camping world that was a different company altogether in Tacoma Washington um, and they did all right you know uh, you just got to be patient and we want and that was our first time our full timing and you tend to want to just you want to go 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 really bad so it really drove us crazy back then now with a little bit of a experience under our belt we tend to be a little more patient than we were back then so so anyway, so you hit the road, and one of the things we did um, as soon as we did hit the road after I retired is we went directly to Ocean Shores, and you've heard me talk about uh, the uh, one week of boondocking. We did that on purpose to find out whether uh, our Wi-Fi Ranger would be helpful, would our generators work okay, is our battery systems work, would it support all the things we do with computers and and cameras and stuff and the answer was yes and kind of sort of <laughs> so one thing I discovered really quick when you're free camping we were this was winter time it was like in January in Washington so it was colder is I told you before in our shows before is even though I found free camping it still cost me 20 to 25 dollars a day in propane <laughs> Because between generators and keeping warm, because it was very chilly, um, I was going through propane like you wouldn't believe it. And I happened to be in an area that charged like two fifty, three dollars, almost three dollars for per gallon for. Anyway, I was spending like twenty five dollars per tank to fill them up, and I went through a tank a day, and I have two tanks. So I was like, that wasn't free camping as far as I was concerned. It was it was just as much as an RV park, if you really want to think about it. So, uh, But it gave me a chance to figure out that, um, well, it explains why a lot of people boondock in warmer climate, because uh, heating your RV is expensive with propane. Um, so, uh, yeah, just um, keep that in mind. So... Uh, um, when you travel, you'll also find out like maybe when your cupboards didn't hold your dishes the way you wanted them to. Maybe some fell out. Um, that was a time that Sherry and I discovered we need to put Velcro straps around the cupboards uh, handles to hold them in place so they didn't swing open. Um, just little things like that. So once again, don't go too far from your main uh, area. Figure out what, and then new problems that might show up that you're not you're moving your rig so much will show up during that point. Like maybe you find out you have a bad jack that's leaking, or maybe a leveler is a another way to call it. Maybe you'll find out a particular uh, 
uh, vent fell off the roof because the screws weren't put in right or didn't connect correct correctly you'll find this through the movement of your rig so you're going to have these expenses of one is preventative things like maybe velcro straps and things like that uh, maybe you'll find that you need to reorganize one of your shelves uh, maybe you'll find out your furniture the way you did it wasn't holding up well during transport You'll also find uh, a lot of little things you may not have thought of once you started getting mobile. So uh, you may have some nickel and dime little uh, items come up and stuff. So one of the other things I was going to talk about, I keep forgetting to talk about, is uh, when you start out, um, is an RV is a terrible investment. So I don't care what you say, they're a bad investment. Um, unlike houses, they don't... Um, with the exception in 2018, they don't appreciate. They just drop, drop, drop. So I'll be the first one to tell you that just like many people that buy new RVs, which I like new RVs because you know what you're getting and you kind of, as a, you grow with the rig, you kind of know the ins and outs of what goes bad and what needs to be maintained closer. Um, you'll be underwater. I'll just tell you that. Um, uh, unless you're constantly trading upward you and well, when you stop doing that you will realize that you have an rv that is worth a lot less than what you owe on it if you financed it or you will discover that you own an rv you paid cash for and lost a lot of money let's say you paid fifty thousand dollars in cash for your rv when you go to sell it, you will realize it's only worth twenty or twenty-five thousand. Um, no matter what, it's a bad investment. Now, typically, a lot of people um, will just continue to trade up, and so sometimes you can wash out that difference in uh, costs um, through upgrading. But one along the way, somewhere along the way you'll be going, okay, I'm done. This is the RV we like. We're going to hold on to this one. That's when you discover that it's going to be a long time if you financed it, whether that rig is going to be, um, well, you'll be underwater for quite quite some time until it's almost paid off. And or uh, if you paid cash for it, you can always sell it and get rid of it, but you will take a loss. Just either way, you're going to, take a loss. It's just how much of a loss and how painful do you want it to be. So just keep in mind uh, in, in your exit strategy, um, you may want to put in your ex exit strategy if you de decide to have one, that you're going to hold on to the rig and use it for weekend warrior stuff. And also keep in mind that you probably, if you financed it, uh, it'll take 8 to 10 or 12 years that you financed it to finally get to a number where you could sell it for what you owe on it. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, but typically if you own a, uh, something that you paid cash for, you could always sell it and get rid of it, but you will take a loss. So do you lose the cash up front or lose the cash later? <laughs> it's just, that's the decision you got to make. And then of course, uh, if it isn't a motor home, which are very expensive, uh, you've not only dealing with a trailer or fifth wheel you're dealing with the truck or whatever you're using to pull it with and uh, so uh, some people run out and buy brand new trucks and trailer and so you're talking about let's say 70,000 plus or minus for the truck and another 50 to 90,000 for a good fifth wheel brand new and if you're financing all that that is as much as a small home um, so when we're talking about the cost of going new, truck-wise and RV-wise, you could be in $150,000 to $180,000 up front. And how you decide to finance that or pay for that, that's all different for everybody. If you buy a good motorhome, if you buy new, you're probably looking at $200,000, um, depending on size. And if you go Class C, you can kind of get under a hundred thousand maybe seventy nine thousand up to a hundred and fifty thousand for new um 
that all varies in what you want and size and uh, convenience and things like that. Uh, in the new used world, sometimes you can get a bargain. You get someone who maybe they were RVing for quite a while and one of the spouses passed away and it was underwater for a while and it sat on the house and they finally decided to sell it to get what they could out of it. Um, you could possibly pick up a really good deal on a used RV, but I highly recommend that you are somebody can work on rigs. So some of the investments that you're going to be putting out is going to uh, be on tools, uh, preventative stuff, uh, learning how to fix things, uh, but also having the tools to do it. And then, uh, of course, the cost of uh, having certain things that support your RV, like uh, slide lube and uh, um, uh, the sealant lubes and um, uh, things to wash and wax the side of your RV and um, different kinds of things we use to maintain them. Uh, I tell you one thing that's been the best investment ever, as I, I've mentioned this in shows before, is make sure you have a good tire pump. That I use a Viair, and uh, we love it. And even though we're not RVing that much anymore, we still use the darn thing for, uh, we used it for our boat trailer too. And uh, and once in a while, um, uh, if I'm worried about a truck, I mean, it's just good to know that sometimes if you have spare tires on your rig, um, you may find they don't have much air in them. Having a vi air near, nearby is kind of nice. So um, make sure you – tires is everything. And uh, one of the things that came across our biggest problem with the fifth wheel, and it happens with trailers too, is the tires are cheap. So I would literally take your new rig – Go to like a Les Schwab if you're up in Northwest or Discount Tire. Have them analyze the tires you have if you don't know that much about tires. And ask and ask them, are these decent tires? And what problems would I have with these kind of tires? Is it a good idea to invest in maybe higher quality truck tires instead of trailer tires? That's what I did because I learned the hard way when I had one explode on the highway and damage my RV and cost me a lot of money uh, to replace the panels and stuff uh, because the tire just literally tore the crap out of the, the fender and the side panel and I had to have all those replaced and that was not fun at all. So uh, I... It, I put some really good money into high quality tires um, that are not trailer tires or more truck tires that can handle more weight and can handle warmer temperatures and didn't have uh, uh, that. Uh, anyway, I can't remember what sizes I bought, but uh, that was a lesson learned that was costly. So changing the subject before I uh, run out of time on this show is let's talk about camping. Uh, let's talk about boondocking. Let's talk about RV parks, uh, national parks. Um, yeah, we'll just go with that. And memberships. Uh, Sherry and I, uh, we definitely used uh, uh, Thousand Trails. And I keep hearing these people buying the you know five seven thousand member dollars memberships i highly recommend you really analyze that um we went with just the regional kind of things and you can and you can wheel and deal when you deal with these people but we knew we'd be in the northwest most of the time so we bought um the packages that covered basically from washington down to arizona if you're going to travel more it may still make more sense just to buy the little regional memberships and stuff and then uh the other frustrating thing is if you're not much of a planner which you really need to learn how to be a planner nowadays because sherry and i grew up in the days of first come first serve is the more we get down south the harder it was to get into thousand trails that we wanted to use because there was a waiting list they were full and so uh uh, keep in mind that's going to happen. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of people like the boondocking and stuff. 
Boondocking isn't necessarily free anymore either, depending where you go. There could be a fee. Um, some places it may be a 14-day stay. Another one may be a couple of days and a $15, $20 fee. Or uh, They're all a little different. Plan on the fact that you're going to be spending money. Now, RV parks are not cheap anymore. Um, there is like if you're... Like you came down to Arizona in the mega resorts and stuff, you can actually get places to stay full time for months between four fifty on up. Um, because trailer parks down here also have so many uh, uh, park models that it helps sustain them year round. <clears throat> However, uh, good RV parks like uh in, in special places can be very expensive for example one of our favorites is oasis rv resort in, in las vegas you may as well plan on 900 to a thousand dollars a month and that may not include <laughs> i think that's uh well that's gonna be more than that you're gonna be spending you also have to pay for your own electricity so if it's summer months you're gonna be running your air conditioners that could be a, a 100 200 300 dollar bill so it could be over a thousand a month and when we were down here in arizona we stayed in that we thought we we wanted to be in a little nicer more private rv park th than being in the mega resorts so we stayed in fort mcdowell area and that was 800 to 900 a month, depending on what time of season it was. Uh, yes, you can find things cheaper and stuff. And if you just do an overnight, that's when they really nail you. You'll hit, be hit for 35, 45, 55 dollars a night. So uh, one of the things that kind of helped me and Sherry decide that we want to go back into our house is the fact is, is when we're staying in RV parks, which we prefer. Uh, because of the hookups and comfort and, and, and amenities, um, was not all that mo off from just owning a house and having a mortgage. So uh, if you're paying $900,000 a month for your RV space, well, for a couple hundred more, you could maybe mortgage a house. And that's the rationality we actually came up with. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would have to conclude that the cost of RVing is probably, unless you cut corners and really minimize your lifestyle, is probably no different than living in an, a house or apartment. So just get that through your mind. It's like some people say, well, I'm doing it to really save money. Well, yeah, you could do that if you bought like a used RV and you had a little bit of skill to be able to maintain equipment uh, and did a lot of boondocking and stuff. But your lifestyle would, that lifestyle can get old. Um, and it also depends on your age and what you're willing to do and not do. And do you like to be around a community or not be around a community? Do you like amenities? Do you like group things? Do you like swimming pools? Do you like um, swap meets and and uh, dances and and, and uh, or do you want to just keep going? Are you are you kind of people that like to be privacy all the time? Those are the things you need to answer. That will affect your cost. That will just, uh, affect your lifestyle. It also will affect whether you enjoy RVing in the first place. So one of the reasons we do shows like this in uh, Living and Lifestyles is to realize that it's different for everyone and you can't really put it all into one class. Uh, it depends on your age. It depends on your income. It depends on your skills. It depends on what you're able to do and can't do. Um, are you retired? Are you not retired? Are you single and not single? Are, uh, do you have pets? Do you have children? All of those factors um, will come in mind. Of course, there's so many other expenses with children. Maybe you're homeschooling. You got have to have computer systems and good internet. That will change the cost in your uh, what kind of internet systems you have. You may have to stay at RV parks that have internet so you have access to networking for schooling and stuff like that. Um, yeah, all that stuff will impact your cost. So... When you go out there and say, I want to, what's all this cost you? Well, come on, people. 
you got common sense. You, you, I guess the big thing is you need to learn to be accountable for yourself. What is your needs? And if you want to see RVs, go see, go to RV shows. Go look at used RVs. Talk to people. Act like you're going to buy an RV and go look at some used ones and somebody it has in their property. Go check them out and get an idea for real cost because it'll be different for you. You may not want brand new and you may not want to buy brand new because you know there's a loss. You're going to lose a lot of money. Just face it, 50% or better of buying something new. Um, if you buy used, are you up to, are you got the health of getting up on the roof and checking out for leaks and, and maintaining and washing your RV and can you fix things? Are you good with electrical and plumbing? Are you good at checking out, uh, fixing, t you know, changing tires? Can you do hitches? All those are factors. That's what some reason people go with motor homes because they don't want to deal with hitches. Um, and then, of course, when you're towing, do you want a tow package in the back or do you want to use a dolly system? Uh, that'll cost you, you know, probably a good thousand dollars or more for a good dolly. Or if you get the other system where it hook up, you got that's probably two to five thousand dollars, I believe. And that's a tow system you put on the back of your motorhome and a braking system that you have to put inside the driver's area by law. And, uh, and you may want to add some extra lights uh, on your rig to uh, for safety. So it really, cost depends on you. Cost depends on your needs. Cost depends on your resources and what you can afford. And then your lifestyle. But I would do everything you can up front. Don't be in a hurry to hit the road. And experiment and find out up front what difficulties you're going to have with stirring things, living in things, day-to-day life uh, problems. Um, uh, so you, the nickel and dime things uh, are taken care of up front before you even hit the road. Otherwise, you'd be a little overwhelmed, I would say. Uh, also, it depends on whether your rig's a lemon or not. You could find out you have a rig that's just breaking left and right all the time. I've, I've met people before. It's like, I think he had a, um, a forest design class C. And he said it was the biggest nightmare he ever had. Everything was breaking. And he was not a happy camper. And uh, literally was not a happy camper. And uh, so uh, sometimes you luck out and you get a rig that's just built well and it just stays together and has minimal problems. And then you have others that are just plain old lemons. And you need to discover that up front before you get way out there and your resources are harder to get to. Uh, remember, RV, part, uh, RV um, maintenance places, sometimes you need to wait weeks before you can even get in because... The popularity of RVs, uh, RVing has grown so much, but there hasn't been a whole lot of new RV repair places. So, uh, and then, uh, of course, if you use mobile RV people, uh, your cost per hour could be a lot higher. And uh, so, anyway, it's, but I tell you, if you're um, a person with maintenance background and learn RV stuff uh, as far as maintenance, uh, it's a great side business that you could have and take along with you <laughs> if you want to do that. Some people start RVing because they don't want to work anymore. And uh, that's actually generally the case out there. So uh, <laughs> so I hope if anything in this show is is we give you general ideas for costs and, and monies and stuff, but it all depends on what you want to do and what your resist, what you, how much money do you have now? That's why I always say, people, if you're young, get an idea what all this stuff costs and prepare for it before you quit your jobs. Put money aside or get rid of that student loan or whatever it is you have out there and get prepared so you can do this and actually enjoy it. And then maybe if you're not mechanically inclined and you want to be one, it's you know, maybe get a rig early 
and start working on it. Put it over at your parents' property or something and work on it and get it ready and take a year or two before you do hit the road. And by then you'll learn how to paint and maintain and do plumbing and, and work on a rig that you're trying to fix up and you'll appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, to me, cost isn't so important as it is getting organized and getting prepared and realizing what you're capable of to me is um, probably more important than cost because really to sum up cost is it's not that much different than owning an apartment it's not that much different than owning a house you have unexpected costs planned costs and then cost for um, daily life uh, and you need to figure out what those things are and uh, and also if you're gonna run your career out of your RV that will create a whole new set of expenses for air cards uh, extension systems like Wi-Fi Ranger things like that so I'm kind of summarizing the whole thing we talked about in this particular show and uh, I hope it's been helpful to you it's it really I'm telling you go hit the bricks go ask questions go to RV dealers go look at used RVs at people's houses don't tell me you're not actually gonna buy um, uh, look at the new things you can do with memberships of camping and get a true idea of what RV parks cost if you're like me most of you <laughs> think RV parks shouldn't cost very much They're, they've gone up in price because of supply and demand just natural so uh, that's more expensive now so you need to keep that in mind so anyway guys we're running out of time and I want to thank you very much for listening to RV talk radio we love your comments pro or con please make them professional and uh, uh, we'll try to respond to them so once again take care buy yourself an RV be safe and have a great day everyone bye now thank you for watching our video please take the time to like subscribe and share our videos all over then go down to the description and think about becoming a member of our patreon this will allow you to get special content just for you and help us build future content thank you